We are wounded. We are in pain. In a world that does not understand the meaning of the human body and of human sexuality, we become people with deep wounds. Our sexuality is a place where wounds of rejection reside, where fear resides. Shame is so intimately connected with the sexuality of the human person and our bodies. We live in a world where we feel used as men and women. And the way the modern world is coping with this pain that very deeply and intimately registers in our bodies as men and women is by holding out to the world a kind of liberation or salvation from the body, from this flesh. Christianity, and this is what we want to discuss in this video, Christianity holds out not salvation from the flesh, but salvation of the flesh. That's what we're going to dive into here. If you want to follow along with some of my notes, check out the PDF below and you can download that and follow along with me as I go through this. I begin here with a quote directly from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is Catechism 1015. We read here, the flesh is the hinge of damnation. <laughs> no, no, the flesh is not the hinge of damnation. That was a joke, but a lot of people think that. No, the Catechism says, the flesh is the hinge of salvation. We believe in God, who is creator of the flesh. We believe in the word made flesh. The word is the logos, the logic, the purpose, the meaning behind everything. The logos is another name for God himself. And we believe that the logos, the word was made flesh in order to redeem the flesh, not to redeem us from the flesh, but to redeem the flesh itself. The Catechism goes on to say, we believe in the resurrection of the flesh. We're going to unpack this. This is the boldest proclamation of Christianity, that the afterlife is not a liberation from the flesh. It is liberation of the flesh from the corruption of death. That's what Christianity holds out. We believe, again, in the Word made flesh in order to redeem the flesh. We believe in the resurrection of the flesh, stunning, which is both the fulfillment of the creation and the redemption of the flesh. Catechism 1015. Now, this whole focus on the flesh, the Word made flesh, the resurrection of the flesh, the redemption of the flesh, this is so contrary to what people, generally speaking, think of religion or, got to put this in quotes, spirituality, right? In general, we think of religion or spirituality as a flight from the body to reach God. But think about it. Christianity represents the exact opposite movement. It represents God taking on a body to reach us. What does this mean? A among many other things, it means, it means we don't have to try to shed this skin to reach God. He took on our flesh to reach us. Indeed, when we are intent on divorcing ourselves from our bodies in seeking liberation, we can make no sense of a God who is intent on wedding himself to our flesh to liberate our flesh, to redeem our flesh. Pope Benedict XVI says, here he quotes from St. Paul, the letter to the Hebrews. Perhaps it wasn't written by St. Paul, according to some biblical scholars. Regardless, in the letter to the Hebrews, we read, 
a body you have prepared for me. And these words are the sentiment of the second person of the Trinity, right? A body you have prepared for me. This is God's eternal son speaking to God, his father, right? The eternal son who is God, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, saying to God, his father, a body you have prepared for me. And then Pope Benedict XVI says that this brief sentence, quote, contains the entire gospel and the fullness, the whole fullness, he says, of sacred scripture. So we have right here the whole fullness, the whole message summed up, a body you have prepared for me. Christianity stands or falls on the mystery of the incarnation. At the heart and center of Christianity, uh, as the word Christianity itself indicates, is Christ. And it's the incarnate Christ. We know nothing of the second person of the Trinity without the fact that in the fullness of time, God sent his son, a male child, born of a woman. And one of the things so important that we learn in John Paul II's theology of the body is that it is always male and female together that tells the story, this theological story. This is the dramatic proposal of the Christian faith, that the body is the very vehicle God himself uses to reveal his innermost mystery. What is the innermost mystery of God? What does Christ reveal? Christ reveals that he is the son of the eternal father and that he and the father share an eternal love that is another person, the Holy Spirit. What we learn in Christian revelation through the body, that's what Christian revelation is, it is ultimately God revealing himself, Christian revelation, through the body, right? That is Christian revelation at its peak, at the summit of Christian faith, is God saying to the world, this is my body given up for you. And let's get even a little more specific. It is God as bridegroom saying to his bride, the church, this is my body given up for you. At the very pinnacle of Christian revelation, we have the body. At the very center of Christianity, we have the incarnate Christ, who, and here I'm quoting from the Second Vatican Council, Christ, in the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, how does he reveal that? Through his body, right? Through his male body, right? It is critical that at this consummate moment, when Christ the bridegroom says to his bride, this is my body given up for you, it is critical that there is a male on the cross and a female at the foot of the cross. Why? Because what's happening here in the full revelation of the mystery of the eternal exchange of love found in God, what is happening here is the consummation of a mystical marriage. And the artist who designed this crucifix, known as the unity cross or the nuptial crucifix, he is making explicit in this work of art what is implicit in every crucifixion. And here I go back to St. Augustine, who says, Christ mounts the marriage bed of the cross, not in pleasure but in pain, to give up his body for his bride. And who's at the foot of the cross here? The new Eve, Mary, right? Notice here in this relationship, Jesus doesn't call her his mother. He calls her woman. And whenever Jesus calls Mary woman, we're at a wedding. Where else does Jesus call Mary woman? He calls her woman also at the wedding feast of Cana where he tell, tell, tells the woman, my hour has not yet come. But here at the cross, the hour has come. What hour? 
the hour of the consummation of the marriage. What does Christ say from the cross? Woman, behold your son. Who's the son? The beloved disciple. Here on the cross is where the body in its maleness and femaleness, male on the cross, female at the foot of the cross, new Adam, new Eve, bridegroom, bride. Here's where the full revelation through maleness and femaleness happens of what the inner life of God is. What is the inner life of God? It is the eternal generation by the Father of the Son to share between themselves the love of the Holy Spirit. What is the Christian life? <laughs> it is the invitation to bodily participation in that exchange of love. When Christ talks about the kingdom, your kingdom come, your will be done, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This kingdom, we cannot enter this kingdom, Jesus says, unless we are regenerated, born anew by water and the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus is confused. He says, can a, 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 can a person enter his mother's womb a second time? Notice Jesus doesn't say no, but rather he raises the conversation to a supernatural level. The natural reality of our creation as male and female and the call of the two to become one flesh, this bodily sexual reality, that natural bodily sexual reality is the foundation here that leads the way, opens the way, paves the way, if you will, to the supernatural reality. Because grace perfects nature. And the very word nature comes from the Latin word natus, which means to be born, to, to be generated. The most natural reality there is, the foundation of human nature, <laughs> The foundation of your very existence is the fact that your mother and father, the two became one and generated you in this natural reality, natus, right? But grace here perfects nature. Grace perfects the natural reality of generation. This is what the mystery of baptism is. Baptism is where we are regenerated by water and the Spirit. The baptismal font has always been understood as the womb of the church. And the priest in the blessing of those baptismal waters to make them fruitful has always been in the Catholic understanding of the world, the sign of the bridegroom, bringing the fertility to the bride so that children might be regenerated by water and the Spirit. This is how we enter the kingdom, by being regenerated. And the marriage through which we are regenerated, this marriage in the order of grace, is the marriage of the new Adam and the new Eve, Christ and his church. Now, in the natural plane here, in the, the plane of, right, the first order, Mary is his mother, right? But at the foot of the cross, she's the symbol. We have to read it symbolically. She's the symbol of the bride, the new Eve. And she becomes here, as the new Eve, the mother of all of the beloved disciples of Jesus. She becomes the mother of all the living who have been regenerated by water and the Spirit. Again, the new Adam says to the new Eve, woman, behold your son, speaking of the beloved disciple who is the mystical offspring of this new mystical marriage. All of this is present in Ephesians chapter five, when St. Paul says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his bride, and the two will become one flesh. That's a quote right out of the book of Genesis, but then St. Paul adds, this is a great mystery, or in the Greek, a mega mysterion. I think that's the way you say it. A mega mystery has a better ring to it. 
This is a mega mystery. Your creation, my creation as male, your creation as male or female, our very sexual being, our being sexual creatures, male and female, or more accurately, sexual persons. This is a mega mystery and it tells a divine story. Indeed, it tells this divine story that God took flesh born of a woman to reveal the love of God, the eternal bridegroom for us, humanity, his bride. This is the story our body tells. This is the theology of our bodies. And this is also why the enemy hates our bodies and he wants us to hate our bodies as much as he does, right? Ephesians 5, not coincidentally, is followed by Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 5, <laughs> sounds kind of obvious enough, but it is a profound truth I'm getting at here. In Ephesians 5, we learn the meaning of our creation as male and female. We learn the meaning of our bodies. We learn the theological story that our bodies tell. And here it is in a nutshell, God wants to marry us. But there's an enemy who doesn't want us to enter this eternal marriage. And his goal is to confuse that theological mystery revealed through our bodies, to blind us to it. And so in Ephesians 6, St. Paul says, you want to live what I was just telling you in Ephesians 5? Get ready for a war. But if you want to, and it end, not but, and if you want to win this war, Paul says, you got to put on the armor of God. Do you know what the first piece of armor is that we have to put on to win this war? St. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, the first thing we have to do is gird our loins with the truth. Our, are our loins girded in the truth? I assume you know what your loins are. Are they girded in the truth? That's the gift of St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body. It helps us gird our loins with the truth. This is why we are in a battle, an all-out raging war in the modern world. And the battleground, it's a spiritual battle, but the battleground is the human body. There is a war for the meaning of the body. On the one hand, the secular world is telling us our bodies are meaningless. And we can assign whatever we, meaning we want to our bodies or we can change or rearrange our bodies however we prefer, because the body's meaningless, blank canvas. On the other hand, Christianity proclaims that the body reveals ultimate meaning. And caught in the crossfire of this war, we, we are wounded. Right? We are wounded here. That's how I began this presentation, by talking about these wounds that we all feel. The solution that the culture is holding out to us, the secular culture, again, is liberation from the body, whereas the solution that Christianity is holding out to us is liberation of the body. Let me turn here, and if you're following along, if you downloaded that PDF from the notes, look at quote number one. This is from an Eastern Orthodox theologian named Timothy Petitsis. I paraphrase here. He says, when we cut the body off from the hope of redemption, first comes licentiousness and then self-mutilation. Very interesting insight here. If you go back to the beginning of the sexual revolution, say, uh, 60 or 70 years ago, it began with a reveling in a licentious approach to the body and sexuality. But this inevitably leads to a kind of hatred of the body. This is the point he's making. He's saying licentiousness leads to self-mutilation. 
acts of self-mutilization, from absurd tattoos and piercings to cuttings, transgender surgeries and suicides, he proposes, and I agree with him, are in fact part of the whole creation groaning in the spirit for what St. Paul calls in Romans chapter 8, the redemption of our bodies. These, these manifestations of, of suffering, we, we are in a deep state of pain and, and, and aggravation. It's an interior pain, but because we are incarnate creatures, our interior pain almost has to be manifested on the outside. And so cuttings, you know, people who will slice open their own skin to bleed, that is a kind of making visible of that interior agony that we are in. These, uh, and I'm not opposed at all uh, to ear piercings or tasteful nose piercings, um, but you know the kind of grotesque piercing that he's referring to. I'm not at all opposed to tasteful decorations of the body, even tattoos, you know, decorating the body with ink in a tasteful way. But we know when we've crossed the line into the grotesque, where we are obscuring the true beauty of the body, this whole idea of, of cutting and, and grotesque piercings and grotesque tattoos and, and mutilating the body with transgender surgeries, let's call it what it is, when a woman is cutting off her breasts, not because she has breast cancer and needs to save her life, but she's cutting off her breasts because she hates the fact that she has breasts. This is bodily mutilation. And the first principle of authentic medicine is do no harm, right? To cut off perfectly functioning breasts is to do harm. To inject the body with hormones that block puberty is to do harm to the true, healthy, normal functioning of the human organism. But all of this, what is this cry? What is this pain? What, what is happening in, in this, this, this aggravated, deep, despairing agony we have about our bodies and our sexuality? Again, Timothy Petitsis, this Eastern Orthodox theologian, proposes these are a, a kind of proto-repentance Proto-repentance means kind of the paving the way for, for a deeper repentance. It is a cry going up to heaven that is honest and direct. And he says, will be answered with mercy for all who join in the cry and accept the mercy that God cannot not pour out on us in super abundance. I want you to reflect for yourself. What is the pain that you feel in your own life that is connected with your body, that is connected with being male or being female? Where do you have a kind of rejection of your own bodiliness? An assignment I often give my students is to start at the top of their head and work the way, work their way the whole way down their bodies, not skipping any part of it, and asking yourself, do I love my hair? Do I love my scalp? Do I love my forehead? Do I love my eyebrows? Do I love my eyelids? Do I love my eyelashes? Do I love my eyes? Do I love my nose? Do I love my cheek? Do I love my chin? Do I love my neck? Do I love my collarbone? Do I love my breasts? Do I love my shoulders? Do I love my arms? Do I love my hands, my fingers? Do I love my belly? Do I love my navel? Do I love my hips? Do I love my genitals? Do I love my thighs? Do I love my knees? Do I love my shins? Do I love my calves? Do I love my feet? Do I love my toes? And I remember one year giving this assignment to my students and hearing a little nudge from the Holy Spirit, Christopher, I want you to do that assignment too. 
And my initial reaction was, well, I've been at this whole theology of the body thing a long time. I think I've kind of come to terms with my bodiliness. No, Christopher, do it yourself. <laughs> so I did that assignment and right away I started realizing, you know what, I don't like the way my hair goes this direction and I don't like the way it goes this direction and I don't like the thickness of my hair and I don't like my, my butt chin because I was made fun of as a kid with my butt chin which you probably can't see right now because I have a beard. Uh, I don't like these age spots and wrinkles I'm getting on my face as I grow older. Uh, I don't like that I'm getting man boobs. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like all kinds of things about my body. And that is understandable in as much as we're made ultimately to have glorified bodies. And these bodies are not yet glorified. And there is a suffering in aging, in decay, in sickness, in maybe we have a certain birth defect. Um, I've got scars on my hip and on my thigh because I broke my femur in a ski accident and I'm held together by a rod and screws. Uh, it's not a pretty sight. The hope again that Christianity holds out to us is not salvation from the body, but salvation of the body. Christ comes as the savior of the body, St. Paul tells us. Yes, it's true. Again, if you're following along here, third bullet, it's true. As St. Paul says, actually, that's not St. Paul. This is from the wisdom literature. It's true that the corruptible body burdens the soul. But our hope, and here's St. Paul, our hope lies not in redemption from the body, but the redemption of the body. It has to be said again and again to let it sink in. Not redemption from the body, redemption of the body. And again from St. Paul, this is 1 Corinthians, when that which is corruptible will clothe itself with incorruptibility. This is what the Christian faith holds out to us. The redemption of our entire humanity. And the true you is not a spiritual soul trapped in a body from which you must be liberated to be your true spiritual self. No, the true you as proposed to the world in Christian anthropology, the Christian understanding of what it means to be human, the true you is the profound unity of body and soul. I wanna press into this point a little bit more. Look at quote number two. This is also from the Catechism, which I quoted earlier. This is Catechism number 365. The unity of soul and body is so profound, the Catechism says, that one has to consider the soul to be the form of the body. Now that's a, an expression we don't typically use, the form of the body. What does that mean? This comes from the scholastic tradition. St. Thomas Aquinas borrowed his language here from Aristotle. The soul is the form of the body. We tend to think of the body as the form of the soul. We tend to think of the body as containing the soul. But in Christian anthropology, it's the reverse. The soul is what contains and forms the human body. One insight here, one way to get into this truth is to put it this way or to look at it this way. What happens at death? At death, the body and the soul separate. But this is not natural. This is not according to human nature. The separation of body and soul was never meant to happen in God's plan. This is the tragic result of sin entering the world. When sin enters the world, death enters the world. And the very definition of death is the rupture, the separation of body and soul. And on that note, think of it, think of this with that truth in mind. If you're trying to live a spiritual life, 
divorced or ruptured from your body, guess what you are? You're, you're dead, right? Because that's the very definition of death, the separation of body and soul. And when this happens, when the body and the soul separate, the body deforms, right? It returns to dust. The body deforms when the soul separates from it because the soul is the form of the body. It is the corruptible body, the Book of Wisdom says, that burdens the soul. The solution, as I keep saying, is not to get rid of the body. The solution is that the body itself be redeemed. Let's go back here to quote number two. The unity of soul and body is so profound that one has to consider the soul to be the form of the body. Right? It's not that the body contains the soul, it's that the soul contains the body. It gives it its form. Spirit and matter in man are not two natures united. You do not have a spiritual nature united with a physical nature. You don't have two natures, you have one nature, I have one nature. That one nature is human nature, and human nature is the marriage of the spiritual and the physical. So much is at stake here in separating human identity from the body. And that's the world we live in right now. We live in a world, uh, indeed, here in the United States where I live, it's already written in law that we identify somebody without reference to his or her body. But what happens when you try to identify somebody without reference to his or her body? Quite literally, you identify no body, right? All this talk in the modern world about identity when in reality we're becoming a culture of no bodies. This is very dangerous for us. And Christianity proposes to us that in rupturing identity from the body, we are introducing death into the human experience. Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, death has already been introduced obviously by original sin, but it's like we are, we are agreeing with death. We are saying it's a good thing. We're saying this rupture from the body is a good thing. Christ came to conquer death and he conquered death by death in taking death on in his body and in being raised bodily from the dead. Death has been conquered. In other words, what has been conquered is the rupture of the body and the soul. What has been healed is the rupture of the body and the soul. Redemption, therefore, in the Christian sense of the word, always involves this healing of the rupture between body and soul. Let's press in a little bit more deeply here. This is a quote from Joseph Ratzinger, who would later become Pope Benedict XVI. Quote number three. He says, when a person rejects his bodily identity, notice those two words together, right? When a person rejects his bodily identity, he or she thereby strikes a blow against his or her deepest being. He or she holds himself or herself in contempt because the truth is that we are human only in so far as we are bodily, only in so far as we are this unity of body and soul. That's the very definition of our humanity. Only in so far as we are male or female, man or woman. This is what defines our humanity. Christ himself says, and can't you just imagine him here? Maybe uh, walking into the Facebook diversity team meeting where they were elaborating on the multitude number of genders that they were going to list on the Facebook profile page. Uh, last time I checked, there are over 50 of them. But can't you just imagine Jesus walking into that Facebook diversity team meeting and saying, haven't you read 
that in the beginning, God made them male and female. Right, this is what Jesus says to the Pharisees when they bring to him questions about the love of a man and a woman. Uh, he says, he points them back to the beginning, to the blueprint of our humanity. Haven't you read that in the beginning, God made them male and female? Anything else here is going to be a twisting, a distortion of that original beautiful reality. And when we fail to go back to the beginning, to the origin of the human reality, the reality we call humanity, when we fail to go back to the beginning, here's the tragedy. We end up normalizing what is a distortion of the beginning. And we no longer have a proper model of human health and well-being. In fact, we end up redefining that which is a departure from human health and well-being as, as if it were human health and well-being. We start calling what is unhealthy healthy and what is healthy unhealthy. We start calling what is good evil and we start calling what is evil good. And this is the world we live in now. How do we know what is healthy and unhealthy, what is good and what is evil? We have to go back to the beginning. That's where Jesus leads us. So that was a little side trail there, but back to Ratzinger's quote. Uh, when we reject our bodily identity, we thereby strike a blow against our deepest being. We hold ourselves in contempt because the truth is that we are human only insofar as we are bodily, only insofar as we are man or woman. Hence, he goes on to say, the question of the human body and human sexuality has high stakes, nothing less than the reality of the creature, nothing less than the reality of what it means to be human. Again, as the whole overarching theme of this presentation underscores, right? We're talking about salvation not from the body, but salvation of the body. This comes to its fulfillment in Christ's promise that on the last day of human history, we will be raised bodily. We say it right in the final lines of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. A Men, those are the final lines of our creed. We believe in the resurrection of the body. But do we really? I have um, often asked priests when I do a priest convocation, I've often asked Catholic priests to give me a guess as to how many of their parishioners, the ones who actually come to Mass on Sunday, how many of them believe that the afterlife is where we are finally liberated from the prison of the body and the soul breaks out of that prison to live forever spiritually liberated from the body. The lowest estimation I've ever gotten from a group of priests is about 75%. On average, it's like 90-95%. The priests tell me they believe 90 to 95% of their parishioners have this heretical view of what it means to be human. That our true humanity is a spiritual reality ruptured, indeed liberated from the body. This is not our faith. Let's take a deeper look here. Look at what Pope John Paul II says in his Theology of the Body. This is quote number four. He says, the truth about man's destiny cannot be understood as a state of the soul alone, separated or, according to Plato, the philosopher Plato, liberated from the body. It was Plato who said that the body is the prison of the soul, and at death the soul is liberated from that prison. Many Christians have adopted that pagan philosophy, that pagan understanding. That is not a Christian understanding. John Paul goes on to say, no, we must understand our ultimate destiny 
as the definitively and perfectly integrated state of man brought about by a perfect union of the soul with the body. My brothers and sisters, we got to let that sink in. It will change the way you see everything. Because not only are our bodies promised redemption, the whole universe is taken up into the redemption of the body. Christ promises us in the final reality, not only a new humanity, but a new heaven and a new earth. You can never look at a tree or a flower or a dog or a squirrel or a sunset the same way again when you know that all of creation, all of the physical universe is implicated in the redemption of the body. This is why St. Paul says all of creation is groaning as in labor pains. Right? And there it is, again, that imagery back to generation, new birth, labor pains, waiting for us to say yes to the redemption of our bodies. Listen to what Peter Kraft says here. Peter Kraft has such a way with words. He says it very insightfully. A soul without a body is exactly the opposite of what Plato thought it is. It's not free. It's bound. It's in an extreme form of paralysis. When death separates the two, we have a freak, a monster, an obscenity, he says. That is why, and I love this point, that is why we are terrified of ghosts and corpses. <laughs> Though both are harmless, they are the obscenely separated aspects of what belongs together as one. What are the, the makings of a horror movie, right? Ghosts and corpses or zombies. Why? Because the separation of body and soul, whether we're dealing with ghosts or corpses, it's horrifying. That's why it's the very subject matter of our horror movies. Again, let's, let's see if we can, we can just sit back for a moment and, and take this in. That our bodies, yes, they are destined to return to dust. But that dust is also destined to be divinized. To be gathered up similarly to the way at the beginning of time God gathered the dust and breathed his life into it. Similarly, at the end of time, can't we imagine God gathering up that dust and breathing his divine life into that dust? Thus, thus, <laughs> thus, definitively divinizing the dust of our humanity, recreating us, redeeming us, restoring us. It's very understandable that there are things about our bodies that we're not so fond of in this fallen world. But in the resurrection of our bodies, those very things we were not fond of will shine with the glory beyond imagination. And why am I pointing to my chin here? Because I so often think of all those people who made fun of my butt chin when I was a kid. Christopher has a butt chin. I can't wait till the other side at the end of time when my butt chin is shining with such glory and all those people come up to me, <laughs> this is what I imagine anyway, people coming up to me beholding the glory of God revealed through my glorified butt chin and saying, Christopher, we can't handle the glory. Forgive us, forgive us. My brothers, my sisters, let it become your goal not to seek salvation or redemption or liberation from your body. Let it become your goal to seek the liberation, the redemption, the salvation of your body. The other approach attacks our humanity and attacks our faith at its deepest foundation. 
and we end with a crippling Manichaean view of the world. What do I mean, Manichaean? Manichaeism is an ancient heresy that basically says spirit good, body bad. This is not our faith. If the body is bad, the incarnation is blasphemy, right? Let's look at uh, what John Paul II says here about Manichaeism. Number seven, he says, Manichaeism sprang from dualism. Dualism is that ruptured view of the spiritual and the physical. And it saw the source of evil in matter itself, in the body. And therefore, Manichaeism condemns all that is bodily in man. And since in man, bodiliness manifests itself mainly through sex, this Manichaean condemnation was extended to human sexuality, to marriage, and to conjugal life. He goes on to say, this way of understanding and evaluating man's body and sexuality is essentially foreign to the gospel. Anyone who wants to see a Manichaean perspective in Christ's teaching would be committing an essential error. Right? Sometimes we can think, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Christ says, if you even look lustfully, you've already committed adultery in your heart. I can sometimes think that Christ is condemning the body and sexuality itself. No, he is not condemning the body and sexuality itself. What he's saying is, let me bring about the redemption of your body and sexuality so that you have another way of seeing, experiencing, and living sexual desire and attraction. Because with the result of original sin, sexual desire and attraction has become inverted. It's become a self-seeking thing that is precisely what causes this harm and damage and why we treat one another as objects to use for our selfish pleasure. Let these words of Jesus be oil on your wounds when Jesus says, in the beginning, it wasn't this way. I'm here to show you another way to see, another way to think, another way to experience your body and your sexuality. John Paul brings out this point when he says, quote number eight, while for the Manichaean mentality, the body and sexuality constitute an anti-value, in other words, body and sex bad in the view of Manichaeism, for Christianity, the body and sexuality always remain a value not sufficiently appreciated. In fact, he says, the Manichaean condemnation of the body and sex might and may always be a loophole to avoid the requirements set in the gospel. My brothers and sisters, if that Manichaean approach says body and sex bad, Christianity says body and sex so good we have yet to fathom it. And that Manichaean approach, he says, may and might always be a loophole to avoid the requirements of the gospel. What are the requirements of the gospel? It's the invitation to follow Jesus the whole way through his death and resurrection so that we can come out the other side with a new humanity, a reintegration of body and soul. That's a hard journey. That real redemption of our bodies means a real dying with Jesus to enter into a real resurrection with Jesus. And that's not an easy road. Living a spiritual life divorced from our bodies, hey, that's, that's a lot easier than actually going on the journey of reintegrating the body and the soul. Perhaps we could put it this way. It is easier to reject our bodies and our sexuality than it is to look at the painful reasons we are inclined to reject our body and our sexuality. Jesus invites us on this road, the road of exposing all of our pain, all of our fears, all of our shame, all of our diseased ideas about our bodies and our sexuality, all of our painful memories of 
the way we were exposed and taught about sexuality, exposed to and taught about sexuality. And for so many of us, that came through a very pornographic, distorted, corrupt vision of things, which of course has caused us great pain. Perhaps the solution here to all of our pain in this world is not to reject the place where that pain is lodged in our bodies, in our sexuality, but to open that pain, to open our very wounded humanity, body and soul, to the one who took on a body to redeem us bodily. My brothers and sisters, this is why the Theology of the Body Institute exists, to help men and women just like you enter more deeply into this glorious vision of the redemption of our bodies, the redemption of our sexuality. If you want to go on a journey into this redemption, I invite you to explore the other videos we have on our channel here. I invite you to check the link below to learn more about the courses that we offer, both online and in person here at the Theology of the Body Institute. My brothers and sisters, in a world that says your body is meaningless, I invite you to reconsider. Could it be that your body actually is the key that will open you to the meaning behind it all? If the word was truly made flesh to reveal to us in his flesh the logos, the logic, the meaning, the purpose behind it all, then really and truly, Christianity has something critical, not just to offer the world out there, but to offer each and every one of us. Mm -hmm.